Hello, everyone, and welcome to Attack of Opportunity. Our behind-the-scenes look, yes, I know lately, we have been plugging our second edition Pathfinder playtest, and we say Attack of Opportunity is also for one-shots. But getting back to interviewing content creators that have helped us, that are friends of the pod, not just our cast, but people that we watch. Who does the cast look at? What do, they, what do we look at in our spare time? Or who have we met along the way, traded advice with, traded content with? You know, this time we have a real hands across the water scenario in Eastern Europe, in a country called suburbia. No. Nope. Serbia. Serbia. <laughs> <laughs> The suburbs is where we play D&D, and Serbia is where you will find Mr. Crafty from YouTube channels, Crafty Tabletop Stories on Twitter, on Facebook. Mr. Patrick Filipovic, uh, <laughs> could you say your name for us, sir? Oh, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, this is the third call from my mom. Can we just... Uh, I oh, think, yeah, no, I think it's something, it's I something love, important. I love, like, okay. <laughs> I'm sorry about this. No, no. Put mama. her on. Uh, ne, nisam zvao. Ne, ba, de, odbijam ti poziv, zoveš me treći put, ja mislim sam da je bog zna šta je, jebo te, usrao sam se, usred sam intervjua. Da, ajde, 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 čao. Did you want to rebook? What, what? Did you want to, did you need to deal with family business, family comes first, did you want to rebook? No, 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 it's, it, it's okay. fine, it's fine. That was great, can I please leave that in? Call from your mom is like, we were gaming Pathfinder 2nd Edition, and at the very end of our first episode, the pizza guy showed up. And we just left the tape rolling and we just all jump up and start talking and he's like and he comes into my living room and he's looking at all the microphones and he's like what is this and we're like oh you're on a podcast buddy and it just it fades out but we left it in and we actually did have phone calls from the wife and phone calls from mom so um yeah a phone call from your darling mother and what language were you speaking yeah the, the serbian language in the Serbian language, and is that akin to? Is that like a Slavic language? Yeah, it's a Slavic language. It's uh, pretty much uh, similar to all the languages of the Slavic Eastern Europe, so cool. Croatian, Montenegrin, Bosnian, uh, similar, all of them. That's awesome. I'm a big fan of using the different racial languages instead of just common in any game, and, and I love the fact that I'm talking to an international gamer. <laughs> Today we get to pick the brain of a content creator to show you that. Because one thing we always ask our guests is like, oh, what do you do for a living? And they say, well, I do this, I do this, I do this, right? But it's like a different mindset, a different country. Is it them over the fence? No, this guy is a gamer. End of story. Just like us. Check him out on YouTube. He puts up content. He talks about his experiences. He talks about advice, good advice, and bringing us back to what Crafty really does. Actually creates trinkets, miniatures. I mean, what, what's the top of your line here, Crafty? Well, it's mostly custom dice and dice boxes, but uh, yeah, I, I had, uh, I have been doing some miniatures as well, but uh, I didn't quite like the process. It takes too long, and if I was to do that, I would most probably uh, go for at least five miniatures at a time, so I can do one, bake it, second, bake it third bacon. Yeah, I'll, I'll make you a deal. Like, I'm a Doctor Who fan from back in the day, but my uh, cast member and now son-in-law, G. Tamlin, is a huge Doctor Who fan. If you send us one of those TARDIS dice boxes that I can give him, not not only will I, like, you know, put you in every podcast he's in and he'll just adore you and keep you alive. You know, you'll be immortal at any podcast you play with us because I know Jay Tamlin will keep you alive just for one little dice, dice box that you nailed us. You know. <laughs> All right. C consider it. Consider we, can't, we can't afford the Euro price here. We have no well, budget. So, but uh, yeah. get, let, let, let's start over, shall we? This this has kind of got off the rails, right? But that's, you know, it's a loose conversation. Yeah, right? of we're course. Just we're just chat, chatting across the water. When did you know? Because this is the question we ask all guests on a tag of opportunity. When did you first know that you were a geek, a gamer, a nerd, you know, a fantasy, sci fi, superhero, spy, horror, all that conglomeration going, this is for me, one of us, one of us? <laughs> Was there a defining moment for you? All right, I think that it actually started at a very young age because my mother used to, my, my <laughs> mother, my mother used to feed me uh, Greek mythology when I was a kid, also grim fairy tales and things like that. And uh, finally, I, I ended up uh, reading some sci-fi and uh, epic fantasy myself. Um, yeah, Hobbit was one of the books, uh, Ursula Leguin, Leguin. Uh, I, I don't know how to pronounce her last name. 
Um, yes, yeah, some other authors as well. I, I also read uh, when the first Game of Thrones came out, I read that as well. I think that it all started actually when I was something like four or five, when I realized what the language is, you know, and my mother used to put me to sleep with uh, this uh, Greek mythology. Well, that's an interesting point. Is there like a translation of The Hobbit into like the Slavic languages and stuff? Like a lot, a lot of people forget that. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. This one's on you. <laughs> no, th th this is the wife. All right. This is the wife. Sorry. Um, Not a problem. Is there a translation to all this lore? Because here in North America, I'm in Canada and the US, we have this preconceived notion because we are so Hollywood and we put all this stuff out that like, you know, all fantasy and stuff came from us, but we've heard Greek mythology came from Greece. You know, uh, the British and that side of my family, they, they love all this lore. They're huge into Star Wars, they're huge into, you know, fantasy and lore and stuff. They have their own cons, they have their own um, circles that they run in completely different from the US market that we over here in North America and Canadian market are exposed to. So these classics that you rambled up, the, the Hobbit and every these authors, are they all American, North American authors that have been converted? Or is there some real homebrew Serbia, you know, authors, fantasy novels and stuff that you could only get there and maybe it gets shipped over here that got you going as well? well there are some Serbian authors. Uh, actually, Serbia had a very, very big uh, literature market or how to put it otherwise yeah that's sure. no novelization of all yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah a lot of writers anyways and um yeah some of them were fantasy but uh it it didn't uh live to to the expectations you know of uh, of a young reader fantasy and sci-fi was a little bit dull as of the past at least 20 years in serbia and it finally started uh, coming up again somewhere from from the pits <laughs> of of the abyss and uh, right now we're having some really really good uh writers novelists fiction uh, short flash fiction writers short story writers and yeah uh, i i actually just recently started reading again because finally some some new authors ended up being on the surface you know and it, it really helped me get back into reading. I, I, I think that the last book before this one, uh, I mean, not this one, these few that I read recently, I think that it was Harry Potter, the first book, which was, I don't know how many years ago, 14, 15? Early 90s. 16, I don't know. Yeah, or whatever. Uh, I remember that uh, my brother uh, got Game of Thrones for his... Uh, birthday i think it was his 12th birthday are we talking english copies or like converted to Slav uh converted to serbian oh. Con converted to serbian yeah everything is pretty much translated uh, we do not lack um you know translations we lack authors no no i thought maybe you'd say that was your key yeah. to learning the english language is like you know they, they always have make those jokes about i i learned this language by watching this type of television show and that you know that we learned english through tv or something like that um but you were handed fantasy in your own language when did you start making the transition to just well i could read this in english or do you oh actually i started speaking english when i was three because uh i was exposed to um some uh networks from from uk and us and that's how i basically learned how to speak it and of course uh, a big thing were these internet cafes uh, back in the 90s and uh, in the internet cafes there were a lot of foreign people from all over the world uh, you know just using uh, the internet to connect to their families and I met a lot of uh, people English-speaking people and that's where I got the courage to start speaking it uh, you know like as if it my as if it was my own language no nope. We lost him. We lost him, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Internet over in Serbia isn't that great. Jeff down, Jeff All right. down. What are we going to do? Oh. I can't work under these there conditions. This one's on his oh. end as well. <laughs> Let's try again. Cue, cue the music oh. again. Here oh. we go. Restart the intro music. Try oh. this again. I can't work <laughs> under these conditions. What is... All right. Okay. Uh, that was only a short gap. I can edit that, but... Uh... <laughs> I might leave that in. It was kind of funny. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Definitely. Uh, where, where do you want me um, to start? Uh, no, you, you had finished. You had talked again. about. 
the internet cafe and then you said oh you finished your sentence yeah. oh you're frozen and then i lost you so no no i think oh. we're good for the next so i feel like i'm pushing my own interest um in the D, &D languages let's speak elven let's speak dwarven and then like sort of projecting it onto you going oh this guy speaks more than just english and you know give us a peek into that just one last point is the countries like you are neighboring to italy romania greece are all in the neighborhood type of thing you're talking about like you know all the the international people all cram over here. We're sort of isolated way across the ocean. North America um, is a melting pot of culture, which we proudly embrace, but it's not, it's been my experience, at least it's not so much where people, if someone speaks a foreign language, they just ignore them. Unless somebody comes to you and speaks English or, you know, like a tourist or something, there isn't that sort of, oh, I should really learn a second language because English is drilled into us. Now, Canada is a bilingual country. But again, my experience is if you're outside of Quebec, where they speak French or French Canadian, then we were taught in school and then just put it down. Um, I'm almost envious of that growing up anywhere in Europe where it's in your face, you are surrounded by these countries. And if you want to interact, then you need to pick up a little bit of this and a little bit of that and a little bit of the other, that kind of thing. And when we game here in North America, everyone speaks common. And you start DM starts forcing, well, they speak in Elvin, maybe who speaks Elvin and who's and they're even the party members. Can we all just speak common? And I'm wondering if that's a byproduct of just being in North America. So my next question for you is when you're gaming, not the real life languages, but when your character is Elvin, Dwarven, that type of thing, do you use the languages more? Or does everyone just get into that? Oh, you know, you're all speaking this one language. Make sure everybody takes that one language and go. Oh, actually. Uh, well, depends, you know, uh, because usually we just change accents a little bit to sound more elven or more dwarven, if that makes any sense. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. We, we, we bastardize real world accents. Like over here, the go to the go to dwarven is Scottish or maybe Irish yeah. or for myself. I even like doing a little bit of like sort of a, a Russian Jew, as it were, for, for a dwarf, that kind of thing. And elves, it's not that they have an accent is they they change their manner of speaking elves speak a little bit more haughty or whatever you know but that's some of the fun now these days everyone's so touchy about stereotypes oh you're insulting this culture oh don't use that it's like no it's not the intent here the intent is not to have every npc that i play or have every character that you play just sound like a regular human that's over there in the village <laughs> you know yeah you may look different but it's also good to maybe you know and so i fantastic when players bring accents or mannerisms or little things to the table and i'm just curious like you said it sounds like you guys do the same thing over there uh, yeah yeah flavor yeah. we're just talking about flavor yeah ba it's basic flavor you know we we change mannerisms and we change accents uh one time i played a half elf from a supposed italian family <laughs> <laughs> and i i started speaking in uh, i started mixing in italian with the uh, Serbian, the very little words that I know in Italian, I just started putting them wherever I could, you know. <laughs> no, no, so that, it... that, that's great. Um, my go-to podcast, I love plugging these guys, it really shouldn't, my technical advisor keeps going to be trouble, but I love the Glass Cannon podcast. There's no secret that I'm a huge Canonite, as they say. And recently, one of their cast members, Joe O'Brien, has made up a new character called Forebears. And this is a, a barbaric culture, and they have sort of a North American Indian vibe that he's gone with. And he's changed not only his speech pattern when he speaks common to them with an accent and the way, the mannerism in which he speaks, he'll throw in actual, uh, what I believe is North American Indian origin words. And he'll start this sentence and, and run. And it's, it was almost like the movie where you see the guys, they start off in subtitles and they're speaking the language and they flip it to English going, look, they're still speaking their own language. But, you know, since this dialogue's going to run 20 minutes, they flip it to English and it's like a, a seamless blend. And uh, Joe Bryan for the last Canon podcast does it effortlessly. <laughs> and when I heard that, I was like, yes, 20 years and this guy gets it. Why don't my players ever get it? That's what I'm trying to go for. That's what these guys are trying to do. Uh, and it sounds like you're doing the same thing. You just kind of you blend it in. You give it flavor. No offense, man, to any other culture. You're just giving your character a different angle, new life. Yeah, definitely. Now, now we're talking about podcasts. You're actually not a podcaster. You have, you're a content creator and you have a YouTube channel where you, I've noticed you've talked about your gaming experiences and you give a little advice about topics that can cause friction in the game. 
being the good player series and you know handling certain things that happen at your table there are a lot of youtube content creators that do that but that's not your mainstay tell us about your actual like crafty tabletop stories is a brand but your your dice box you're actually a homemade dice kind of bit how did that come about well i i, I was always a crafty person <laughs> Um, I, I used to love doing, uh, you know, woodworks with my uh, father. My, my grandfather, my father's father, was actually a carpenter. So I think that I uh, got that uh, gene from, from him. And my other grandfather, uh, he was, um, he worked as um, chief of constructions. So he was basically a construction worker, you know, just... Uh, architectural constructions and, and things like that and um, I think that I kind of implemented all of all of that uh, craftiness into one thing and um, I I like doing really meticulous work uh, really precise stuff so uh, the smaller thing you give me the better it's gonna look I don't like building big things I uh, I like building small things designing small things and that's pretty much it. So you're like a shoe in for the what they call on a camera lens, the back row scale, like miniature painting, fine detail, brushes that have one tiny little hair sticking out of it. That's your go to. Yeah, yeah, that, that's what I what I like doing, you know, but uh, usually it's it's more about the crafts than the painting painting in itself. So, um, yeah. And, and as, as for the rest, I mean, yeah, as I said in the beginning, I, I do some custom dice and custom dice boxes, and that's my main go to also some uh, rolling trays um i don't know i'm thinking of expanding you know to spell books maybe oh yeah whatever really but um the point the point is dice and dice boxes because everyone's a dice maniac i haven't yet met a person who doesn't love their dice so <laughs> that's that's pretty much um what i go for Yep. Uh, specifically bought official Pathfinder dice, one for Mummy's Mask and one for War for the Crown for Open Cup Pods. And I won't even open them <laughs> until like the first dice roll in that game. Um, do you make uh, dice towers? Like you talk about dice boxes and holders, but do you actually make the dice rolling tower where you drop the dice in the top and it pops out the bottom? I haven't made one yet. Haven't made these? No. Um, as, as a, uh, I wanted one because my desk is cluttered with not just DMing stuff, but the tech to run a pod. And uh, I had went online and I found, you know, for the plastic that's slapped together, $30, $50. I thought, well, that's kind of a ripoff. And I found this one. It's a really hard sort of woodish cardboard uh, from warworldgaming.com. And it was like $14 Canadian, which around the world, American Euro is going to be that much cheaper. Uh, and, and it works just fine. You know, it just function over, you know, fashion. You can get these epic tower looking ones that, you know, show off at the table. But because we're a podcast, we're audio, no one needs to see my tower it works and you could make a killing it, like i said if you could just bring down the price or make something simple that's function over fashion i tell you 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 make a killing we would you you could be i don't know you could be our sponsor instead of me giving getting shit from matt and connor my technical advisors and internet advisors about like plugging something that has no connection with us you know you, you send us swag man and we will uh, sing your praises to the heavens <laughs> um but i digress kind of teasing a little bit trying to get free stuff um uh, you'll get something a, a, a website a website a brand name something beyond youtube do you actually have like a go-to online store where someone can contact you and say hey you know do you do custom work i would like this design done or do you have like the like the tardis dice boxes i love this you love this thing it just kind of pops open like a tall cookie jar and voila dice inside Looks awesome. I love that piece of work. We've got it plastered on our Facebook showing you off your stuff. <laughs> thanks. Uh, thanks about that. The thing with advertising is that I do it mainly on Instagram and Twitter. And the thing is that uh, I am yet to open up an Etsy store, but I need to have uh, like 10 items showing uh, in, in the, how, how do you call that? Showroom, showcase. Yeah, no, yeah. I understand. So, but you are, a, you, people can contact you for your work. You're, you're showing it on Facebook. You're on Instagram. Yeah. You're on Twitter. And if someone is interested in see that sees your stuff, they can contact you and you're good to go. Definitely. With negotiating a price and giving them a time frame. going, well, this could, you know, a lot of, a lot of artist commissions that we talk to are sort of that sort of one-on-one, -on -one, you know, before they get big in a brand and they're backed up so much that you can't, you got to wait months or a year 
but you you are basically what I'm saying is you are up and running. Yeah, I am up and running. You, you, you uh, okay, uh, sometimes I don't take commissions because I get uh, too cramped up in work and commissions. But uh, yeah, lately I think that I'm able to do some, I guess. <laughs> and that's uh, at Crafty Tabletop Stories on Twitter and at Crafty Tabletop Stories on Instagram as well. Is yeah, that right? Instagram and Facebook is at Crafty Tabletop Stories, but Twitter because it's, uh, you know, you need to have a short name. It's just Crafty Tabletop. So, Crafty Tabletop. Yeah, so you, you'll find me like that. No worries. Well, definitely want to become one of your first clients, not just because, you know, we're chummy and all and you're branded a friend of the podcast and taking the time. Thank you so much to be here, be sure interviewed thing. today uh, with the possible, I don't know, uh, <clears throat> friend of the podcast discount coming my way, hopefully. Um, so you have your YouTube channel, you have so that one-on-one -on -one Instagram, you know, you get your crafts going or whatever. What made you want to expand your content just besides just going, hey, this is me, because I've seen a lot of content creators that just talk about their crap. This is my stuff. I make my stuff. Here you go. And they have a, a personal online Twitter account talking to people. But you've started a YouTube channel. And not just drawing attention to your crafts, you actually engage an audience going, hey, these are my experiences. This is what I'm doing. You shoot a video. I absolutely love your promo intro, which you made yourself. And you've actually started selling, taking commissions, I've noticed, for like 10, seven second promos, um, like a video intro for other people, for brands or whatever. So what got you doing your own channel? And then again, you just tagged the craft on it. What got all that started? Yeah, well, uh, I'm a media engineer by trade. Uh, that was my uh, bachelor's degree. Uh, right now, I'm... Uh, Can I have that in English, please? I'm sorry. Immediate engineer. Uh, <laughs> media engineer. So you construct um, media? You, you're like a website programmer or design? No, uh, I really the, should know what this means. But. Oh, basically, uh, an all-around producer. So producer of audio, video, um, animations, uh, photography, and things like that. Oh, wow. Uh, yeah, so uh, yeah, that that's what we did on 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 the university, and uh, my main topic was video content. Uh, I I finished my bachelor's degree with uh, how to make um, how, how do you call that thing in English, like a uh, production uh, for. Um, so like if you're in university, you got to write a thesis and going, this is my thesis yeah. on my subject. It's like your your artistic content project is completed. And yeah. it, it would be your main project to get a grade and put it up there to show the world that you've yeah. learned taking the course. How long does the course take you? How many years were you doing that? Um, well, uh, it was four years of uh, bachelor's uh, studies. Okay. And, and I had another year of master studies, which I haven't finished yet. Uh, I took master's in marketing. Uh, but also, I uh, I focus myself on video content. Uh, right now, I'm I'm doing my master thesis on um, video campaigns. So uh, ba basically, marketing campaigns based on video content. So you basically started these projects in school, and then just kept them going for yourself? Uh, no, no. Uh, actually, the project was uh, let's say a work of love. Yeah, and basically, I. Uh, it, it all started like this. I used to have a company last year. We were doing some um, uh, coaching, uh, to to keep it simple. So we coaching people about um, make their uh, climate, uh, company climate uh, better and things like that. You know, uh, uh, also human resources and uh, basically all around business coaching. Um, but uh, the company did not go well and it took a lot of money, a lot of effort and it did not pay off finally. So I decided that I'm gonna do something that I really love. The only thing that kept me pretty much sane were tabletop RPGs. I was playing once or twice a week with my friends. We had this very cool uh, Rise of the Rune Lords campaign that we played, uh, Pathfinder campaign. And um, yeah, basically that's what uh, kept me going through through that tough period. And eventually, uh, <laughs> the YouTube channel was a little thank you to 
the role playing games. Giving, giving back. Pathfinder, yeah. you say? One of us. I told you it was one uh, of yeah. us. And we actually have, I just happened to happen, it's a shameless plug in, is uh, we have several dungeon masters or game masters, as they have to be called in the expansions like Pathfinder. We're running a Rise of the Rune Lords campaign actual play podcast called Clinton's Core Classics, and we have Clinton Shard. And in that, I'm actually a player as well as running, teching, and producing alongside him. Um, sadly, I'm only in the first season. It was a lot of fun working with those guys, and they've continued on with with me editing the show and co-producing the show. Uh, and Rise of the Rune Lords is the one that, if you say Pathfinder, they know Rise of the Rune Lords. It is the one that everyone loves, that everyone did, and even though it's very, very old, this is why we said we're going to do this. And apparently, you know, it got people through rough times. Look at uh, look at Crafty here. Got him through school. You know. <laughs> yeah. Th- thank you, yeah. Pathfinder. And he's giving back by putting up a YouTube channel and talking about his experiences. You can find him on YouTube under Crafty Tabletop Games. If you want to contact him about maybe him doing some crafty for you little buggers. <laughs> yeah. You can find him on Twitter. You can find him on Instagram. And we're hoping that to see you grow your brand. And that you remain a friend of the podcast, so that we can get all kinds of cool swag. Yeah, uh, the, the deal. But, uh, <laughs> the deal with uh, with the brand because I'm a marketing guy myself. You know, uh, I I grew it as much as I wanted it to grow. Right now, I, I'm a, I have expanded my brand to Twitter as well. So um, I've earned something like uh, one thousand five hundred followers in a month and a half or so. Um, and uh, yeah, it paid off. It paid off. I already got a few commissions from Twitter as well as uh, Instagram. So um, the brand uh, itself is growing and I want to grow it even more. And that's why I'm doing these um, good DM series. Uh, It's basically uh, I'm interviewing people such as you're doing right now about uh, their DMing style pretty much. So how do you suppose to... uh, No, not how do you suppose to. Um, how, what do you, uh, why do you think uh, makes you, what do you think makes you a good DM and uh, what are the advice that you would give to another DM? So um, that's, that's the basic premise of the series. And uh, uh, I have also recorded a lot of video material uh, for um, RPG scenery, which is pretty much um, scenery enhanced to look fairy tale like and uh, with all the sounds recorded and everything. But the thing is that uh, I still don't have a strong enough computer to render that. Uh, the last, uh, the first render that I did took me five, more than five days and it ended up lacking some of the audio. <laughs> so it was, uh, it was hard. <laughs> uh, and I decided just to ditch it for the time being until I get myself some proper equipment so I can do it. Oh, good. Well, if you ever need a guest, you know, I, I am I am trying to gear myself up to be uh, video guest friendly, as you can see here. I'm just scrolling <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Actually, <laughs> actually, shameless uh, plug. I, w- I would like to have you on the show and we should talk about that some some other time. Yeah, off the air, off yeah, the air. Off the air. I, I should really approach this. Not, not, not recording. But thank you so much for being with us here today. Uh, I can't believe that, uh, you know, you gave us the time of day. We're always um, networking, reaching out talking to other podcasters not just looking for fans but we do find it interesting talking to other podcasters and their journey and how far they've gone and you know surpass us or we leave you behind or the journey alongside you we'll be rooting for you man definitely definitely and the more swag you send us you know just gotta say that you know the more (laughs) the stronger advertising campaign in north america we will start but thank you so much for being on the show